Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, the American Wood Council uh, represents about 75% of the major lumber producers and engineered wood products producers in North America. And I, li I happen to live in Rock Hill, uh, South Carolina, just down the road a ways. And we're thrilled to be part of this program, this really excellent uh, program with the Institute. Certainly exactly aligns uh, with our goals as an association. Um, and uh, I enjoy uh, doing what I'm doing. And I've been in South Carolina about eight years. So we're getting, Rock Hill is feeling like home now. And uh, we love it. So and we love the state of uh, South Carolina. So we're glad to be here. The American Wood Council does uh, three things primarily, the staff that is. Uh, the first thing we do is we run the technical committees that uh, do the design standards for wood construction. So how many, how many designers are there in here? Or engineers or architects? Um, okay, other designers? Uh, how about code officials? Great, super. Uh, who else is in here? Well, we have state officials in here, I know. Uh, Anyone else? Anyone not categorized yet like to say who you are? Yes? Foresters. Foresters are in here. Yeah, it's great. Another Forester. Very good. Forgive me for forgetting Foresters. Yes, very important, and uh, thank you. Um, of course, our goals align completely with the Forest Service and the forestry uh, industry as well. And remember, our, many of our members, of course, are um, involved in the forest, in, are uh, Foresters themselves. But we do three, three things, and the first one is we do the design standards for wood construction that are referenced in the building code. The NDS, the National Design Specification for Wood Construction, and the other standards, such as the Wood Frame Construction Manual, I'll say a little bit about uh, later. Then we have a field staff, of which I, I am one, and our job is to uh, answer questions for designers, first of all, on our design standards but also to be involved with code officials and with the regulatory process in the states and locally to be in assistance if we can with keeping the door open or at least keeping it from closing unnecessarily in regard to the use of wood products. So uh, my, a lot of my work, and I happen to work in seven states, South Carolina is one, but a lot of my work is going to the state code adoption meetings uh, seeing what's going on, uh, listening to the concerns, seeing what's happening uh, in regard to the adoption of model codes, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and that kind of work. So that's what I do. And then we have a whole education staff that gets this information out to designers, out to code officials, out to builders, uh, out to building owners, and hopefully it's helpful. So I'll start, you, I'll start you this morning on a quiz. And by the way, we're ahead of schedule. Does that mean I have, uh... we have a little <laughs> Okay. Uh, we'll see how we go. But first of all, a quiz here. Um, building code in general, South Carolina building code, international building code, uh, group M, mercantile building. Okay, possibly we don't have a lot of state uh, uh, regulated, or state owned buildings rather that are mercantile. But let's say, let's call it an M or let's call it a B even, business. This could be business as well. Two stories, uh, wood frame construction, type five. In other words, not, not fire resistant necessarily or not fire resistance rated. Uh, sprinkler system, automatic fire suppression system in the building and surrounded by streets or yards at least 60 feet in width. Uh, okay, the so the question is, what's the allowable area per story? Very good. It came out of the code official group, I think, back there. Okay, excellent. Unlimited in area per story. Now, that may be surprising to you. And the reason I started with this example is if, if I convey one message today, uh, that would be that the building code in South Carolina and building codes in general don't really restrict the use of wood or the choice of wood as a material for a building, okay? as has already been stated this morning. However, we're only building, I think Pat used the percentage last time, about 15 to 
of the buildings that could be built of wood under the building code, designers are only choosing wood in 15 or 20 percent of those cases. So we're not, we're not building, um, but the message here, or if, if I can do anything this morning, it would just be to say, I'll answer your questions, or if we have time for questions afterwards, but I'll, the building code does not really restrict the use of wood uh, as a choice for your frame for your building. Now, we'll see there are some height limits. There are definitely some height limits. We'll see, in the, in the case of the state, there's um, concerns about fire, tar, and tree to wood. I'd like to talk a little bit more about those, uh, too. But in general, uh, it's not the building code that's restricting the use of wood. And I hope the rest of my presentation gives us a comfort level uh, with that concept. Okay. In the year 2000, the first international building code came out. And that's the model building code that's published by the International Code Council. Down here at the bottom, you see these three little insignias. This is an old code now. Uh, but it was the first national model code published by ICC, the International Code Council. And until then, there were three regional code groups, Southern Building Code Congress International, Building Officials and Code Administrators International. That's up in the Midwest. That's happened to be where I'm from originally. And then out west, the International Conference of Building Officials. They all got together. Those code officials, the voluntary organizations in each region, got together and said, let's share our building code information because we don't have a national building code in this country. We, we never have. Now, many countries do, by the way, but we don't. We, we have regional and local and state codes. And the International Code Council at the turn of the, of the century said, let's get a uniform code that can be used by states and used by locations. And it's been very successful. What's happened with the International Building Code, or its advent, you could say, is that the opportunities for wood have opened up. Um, they've taken the, uh, the uh, most of, many of the historic restrictions about building size have loosened. They haven't completely gone away. And I'm not suggesting today, I'm not going to suggest today that fire is not a serious concern. It certainly is. And wood does burn, and that's a serious concern for um, any code official, any designer, and it has to be taken seriously. But the building code takes it seriously. And by the way, this is a general map about the adoption of the international codes across the country. You'll see that South Carolina there is a blue state, which means, if you, if you read this down here, uh, 2012 international building code, that's the basis of the South Carolina code. But July 1st is going to be 2015. Uh, IBC. And by the way, South Carolina is very progressive in uh, its adoption of codes. I'm, and I'm not joking about that. You are far ahead of many states, even very close to you. But why, why has it happened that the opportunities for wood have expanded means of egress? Uh, in, in, in uh, modern model codes is excellent, and that's a primary concern, means of egress. Fire resistance. Uh, the left disc here is the UL Fire Resistance Directory, which is free online now, I guess downloadable, and the right is, happens to be the Gypsum Association Manual. Fire resistance as a concept now is well established in the code. In other words, fire resistance and combustibility are two different things just the ability to burn and fire resistance, how it will perform, how an assembly or an element will perform in a fire uh, are two different things. Uh, so you can build in fire resistance to wood structures and it's an excellent, uh, uh, or wood rather, um, is very conducive to excellent fire resistance and I'll tell you how in a little bit. But that's the second thing, so you have means of egress, fire resistance, and then of course, sprinkler systems, uh, active suppression systems, are uh, a leap forward, in my opinion, a light year leap forward in building safety when uh, automatic fire suppression systems began to be put into buildings. The statistics for life safety are just fantastic for fire sprinkler systems. So, uh, just a quick graph. 
for commercial building, this, is, this happens to be for all buildings. This is uh, from NF, the NFPA website, National Fire Protection Association. Um, fires have continued to go down and kind of level off now. These are structure fires. And that's one of the reasons why the material now of the frame of a building is of less concern is because of the safety features built into buildings. Fires continue to go down for commercial buildings. Um, you can pull this right off the NFPA website. And then um, you might say, well, there's still a whole lot of fires. But just remember that our real fire problem here is in residential. That's where the real fire problem still remains. And the other percentages on the right there show the occupancies, the percent of fires, of all fires, that happen, for instance, in an assembly. I think it's 3% on this screen. Or in a school, is 1%. Um, so these are, for all structure fires, uh, these percentages for commercial buildings are very low. Um, and I bring this up because the uh, topic of wood frame and commercial buildings, and today we're mostly talking about commercial, um, the, the residential market is pretty well sewn up by wood. I mean, we, that's a mo the most common building material. But it's not certainly in commercial buildings, and that's the whole um, idea of today, I guess, is let's, let's talk about commercial buildings and the opportunities there. So, so we're now to here. The, the old one was a 2000, now we're at the 2015 uh, International Building Code. It's about to be adopted in South Carolina. Today, for the, for the rest of the time, uh, I want to begin to give you a, a very quick, very brief outline of what's in there so you get a comfort level with it if you're not already. Most of you are already pretty comfortable with these broad categories that I'm going to talk about. But just as an example of highlighting the opportunities for wood for commercial and some things that may be surprising, the unlimited area buildings thing might be surprising, of course, sprinklers and all that separation, you've got a pretty safe um, building. But what about compared to just a steel frame building that many designers routinely choose because they've learned steel or concrete in school? And they, what about that? Let's just look at a quick comparison as an example. Assembly building 2B, uh, if you're familiar with the construction types, that's a steel or a concrete building. In the new 2015 code, there's an area factor. Uh, the area factor to ultimately calculate the allowable area per story is 9,500 square feet. So that, that's a low figure. You get to multiply it by other factors to make a larger building, type 2B steel building. 3B is one of the uh, wood frame construction types. Type 3 is a combination construction type building. You have, first of all, exterior walls required to be non-combustible. So exterior walls in a type 3B building are non-combustible. But all the rest of the structure can be wood frame. It's also permitted by the model code for non, uh, the, the state's policy is different now on the fire retardant treated wood issue. But for other buildings, you can, the built model code says you can have fire retardant treated wood in your exterior walls and non treated wood in the rest of the building. That also would be a 3B building. And as a matter of fact, nationally, there's a great increase in type 3B residential buildings. When I say residential, I mean apartment buildings. Uh, because we're going with fire retardant treated wood exterior walls and then wood in the rest of the structure. So uh, this has the same area, 95, the same um, area factor, 9,500 square feet. So roughly your 3B building can be about the same size as a uh, 2B building. And if you don't want to use fire retardant treated wood, and you don't want to use non-combustible materials in your exterior walls, and you just have a regular wood frame building, and you build in one hour fire resistance into it, which is really easily achieved for most wall assemblies and floor ceiling assemblies, you actually get a larger building for an A3 for an assembly. So if you have a one hour wood frame building, that's just the structure, by the way. There's not necessary. you might have one hour quarters required and so forth. I'll talk about my handouts later, but there's some things in there that'll help you look at that. But you can have even a larger uh, building than a 2B steel building uh, with 5A. So there's plenty of opportunity 
here for commercial buildings uh, to, be, to be wood frame. Of course, the other speakers today already covered many of them. There's lots of reasons now, more than ever, uh, to build with wood. And these are just a, a few that have already been mentioned and will be mentioned uh, throughout the day. You were handed this document, the Code Conforming Wood Design document. I'm hoping this will be a good resource for you. I'll refer to it as I go through the rest of my slides. All this is is a, is a summary of what the International Building Code says about wood frame. Uh, sets the parameters for you in a little bit easier form than the building code itself, a little bit thinner form, uh, for wood construction tells you in many places where to go in the International Building Code to, to, to find out about wood construction in the International Building Code. So I'll refer to this as we go along. I, I had intended this to be on your flash drives that were handed out. They're not on there for some reason. There's other literature on there, but no worries. You can go to our website if you want this electronically. It's free. There's no copyright. Uh, well, we, I, it's copyrighted, but there's no limits on how much you can print out, distribute, or whatever. So feel, feel free to go to our website, download this, print out more copies, or let me know, and I can get you a glossy uh, copy. This is a good desk reference uh, for both designers and code officials. So. Just a quick review. Broad categories now in the South Carolina Building Code, if you would, or the International Building Code. First of all, it's occupancy-based, so and this, this book covers these occupancies. Um, most of you are familiar with these. Type 5 is, you could say, the lowest construction type. If you want to say from a fire resistance standpoint, it's any material permitted by the code, wood, typically wood frame. No particular fire resistance built in. Next one up is type 4 construction. This is a very unique construction type. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time here because there's some new developments in Type 4. Type 4 is not an easy construction type, though, for a commercial building. I won't pretend it is. One of the things that you have, Type 4 is heavy timber. Uh, but one of the important things with Type 4 is it's no concealed heavy timber in a building. So that's one of the limitations where you don't have a drop ceiling, you don't have mechanicals above the ceiling, you can see uh, traditionally, it's a, a heavy timber frame building where you can see all the floor assembly above. You can see the roof assembly and so forth. Um, but uh, this, this building type uh, will be the focus of some new developments in wood products. I'm going to mention it today, and others will mention it, cross-laminated timber. I'm going to talk about it in a moment, right now, as a matter of fact. What, uh, who, who, who's heard of cross-laminated timber? Okay, great, everybody, you know. I've been in other uh, seminars that uh, many people have not heard of it yet. I'm steeped in this all the time. We talk about it all the time, but actually uh, uh, it's an exciting product because it's comparable in uh, structure. Well, first of all, what are the characteristics of heavy timber? Dimension lumber laminated together in crosswise fashion to create a solid wood section of wall or floor. Dimension lumber, that is, regular 2 by 10s whatever, laminated together in crosswise fashion. So it's been described as a plywood on steroids. I don't really like that uh, description myself because who wants to have a plywood building? That's what I think. I don't want a plywood building. but. I want a structurally uh, strong and fire resistant building. This is, this is huge uh, floor and wall sections put together. It's a technology that was developed in Europe uh, and, they, and now we, it's coming to the United States. We don't have a whole lot of producers yet, but it will be here. It's a very exciting product, prod, uh, product and we'll have um, someone here that today, um, Charles, is it? Uh, Okay, who will talk about a project that they've done with cross-laminated timber, and it will be much uh, more articulate and better described than what I'm saying. Uh, but basically, we have uh, the ability now with strength and with fire resistance to do just about anything we want with 
taller buildings. This has never happened before with wood construction. There's always been a pretty high, a pretty low ceiling rather for height due to structural considerations for light frame wood construction. Well, now those are, are going away because of cross laminated timber. So this is a very big topic. I want to show you, uh, the reason I'm doing it now in type four is cross laminated timber is now mentioned as type four construction in the 2015 International Building Code. There's a product standard it has to be manufactured by, listed in the code. There's a very excellent handbook, design handbook for CLT. That's the second one over. And of course, our own national design specification has a chapter on uh, CLT now. And then on the right is a front cover of a fire test uh, that we did with CLT for an exterior wall. In recent code change cycles, the American Wood Council has put out a couple test code changes, we'll call them. What if we compared a CLT building to what's currently allowed for a type 2B, or a type 2A, rather, building in Chapter 5? It go, goes up to uh, nine stories instead of the traditional limit for light frame wood, which ends at residential, ends at about five. Um, what would it look like? So we put out a code change that said this is what the building could look like and it has this much fire resistance and this how we do it and so forth. In order to talk about that code change, we did some fire tests. First of all, uh, an exterior wall test to get it in type four. But then also, more recently for this current code change cycle, we did a room test with CLT and two layers of gypsum on it. And the reason we used two layers of gypsum was because we wanted to get something very conservative for that nine story, that first nine story building in the code with CLT. This was not ultimately successful, by the way. Did not, this code change did not make it in. It got a majority of votes, but it didn't get the two thirds that we needed um, to get it in. But this was the first step. We have something, um, ICC is doing something different now, I'll explain in a moment. But back to this room test, this was down at Southwest Research Laboratories in Texas, in San Antonio. We, you can read all about all the details of this test off our website, by the way. Uh, we stuffed the room with modern furnishings, tried to get it as hazardous as we could in terms of furnishings, uh, which modern furnishings can be very hazardous in terms of fire load. Uh, lit it on fire, let it burn out, had to, we had to retreat out of the uh, test facility room and into the observation room. It, it overwhelmed the, uh, the smoke overwhelmed from the contents, overwhelmed the exhaust system. Everybody went out of the test you know, room into the observation room. We looked at the monitors, we watched the monitors, that's a picture of that. Um, it burned for almost three hours and then burned itself out. This is, you, can, you can't see the clock, but the clock down here says, Hundred and thirty two. Okay, that's two hours then. I guess that's minutes, I think. Hundred and thirty two minutes. It's still burning in a corner of the room. Um, I'll show you the outside of the room here. There's the outside of the room. This is even after the test, by the way. It's CL it's CLT walls and two layers of gypsum on the inside, on the room side. On the top is not CLT, it's nail nail laminated timber. So it's dimension lumber, nail laminated together on the top. And the, the concrete blocks you see on the top are an attempt to get a floor loading up there, 40 pounds per square foot uh, floor loading. So you can see how the, if it's a floor ceiling assembly, we could see how that would perform. And it burned out. And I think at the end, after we were approaching three hours or something, and they, or maybe that two hour, three minute point or something anyway, they finally decided just to clean up. They put out that little fire in the corner, which was still burning, cleaned it up. It would have gone out, by the way. I mean, it was not going to. Um, there was a little. There was a little charring on the CLT in some places where it happened to get through, um, but the fire was never addressed. The point is, the fire. It was intended to be show that you could achieve a burnout condition with CLT um, in this particular room. So go go look at that test. Look at all the details. It's interesting. Uh, you'll get some type of confidence with certainly the gypsum protection, you know, on CLT. 
Um, it's one concept, one concept. ICC is very, the board of directors of ICC has been interested in CLT and the tall wood concept and that you're going to hear more about it. You're going to see publications on it. They put together a tall wood ad hoc committee. Uh, this committee is run by the International Code Council. It has all material interests represented in it. So other material interests besides wood are represented. Code officials, fire officials, they're all in this committee. They're going to look and see what is the criteria by which we can allow wood to go taller than it can currently. Um, the committee is going to have its first meeting by phone this week and the first in-person meeting uh, sometime in July. At the back of your, at the back of this handout, if you flip through, the last half of this is all uh, building size tables. I'm hoping this will be helpful to you because it cuts through a lot of what you have to do when you use a building code in terms of tabular calculation or factoring tabular numbers to get an allowable area. It's a little quicker. You go back to the back, you look at your use group at the top, you see in the heading whether the building's sprinklered or not. There's also non-sprinklered tables back here. You go to the left, you check your number of stories, you estimate your open frontage around the building, and then you can pull off your allowable area per story right away. So you can estimate uh, your size of your wood frame building right away. As I mentioned, sprinklers automatically get you three times the allowable area for a single story, the tabular area, two times for a multi-story building. There is a way in the building code to deal with mixed occupancies. There's basically two approaches. One is if you don't separate them with a fire resistance rated separation, you consider the whole building the more restrictive occupancy and you go with that for your sizing. The other one is you separate it with a fire resistance rated separation, which can also be wood frame if it's a type three building, for instance. Doesn't have to be a fire wall as such. Um, there's, you got fire walls and fire barriers and fire partitions, but you, you separate it and you uh, do another area calculation for each side in that case. You have some conditions for A4 buildings, uh, E buildings, educational, uh, F2, S2, those are factories and storage, non-combustible goods, unlimited area. That's even without sprinklers. Um, and then you have even some categories for assembly buildings or assembly A1 and A2 within an unlimited area building. So it's all there in, uh, in Chapter 5, uh, 507 of your code. Let me talk about fire resistance. I said CLT is certainly highly fire resistant. That's because of its mass. Uh, it takes a long time to burn. It retains its strength you know, while, while it's burning. That's the beauty of heavy timber construction, by the way. Just general fire resistant principles for the building code as a reminder to most of you. It's driven by the construction type table in 601 that says if you have a certain construction type, you got to have a certain fire resistance to your elements. And this is the, this is the table um, that summarizes that. Building elements on the left, fire resistance ratings there. The building code, I think we're all familiar with running a test, an ASTM E119 test to get a fire resistance rating. But these are actually all the methods listed in the building code for establishing fire resistance. And this is in section 703, and you go to 703.2, and it says test it. And you go to 703.3, and it says, and you can use these alternative methods as well. And they're listed here, and you can see those uh, in the building code. There's some options here. Every single assembly or every single element doesn't necessarily have to be tested in an ASTM E119 furnace. As a matter of fact, every uh, listing in a UL directory or a GA directory, they're not all individually tested either. You can make some judgments about uh, switching or uh, substituting materials and thicknesses as long as we use some basic fire resistance principles to make good judgments. Mm -hmm. But one of the other methods besides testing is a calculated fire resistance. I just want to mention that because wood is particularly, there's lots of opportunities and it's really the only material where you can 
uh, readily and easily calculate its fire resistance, what's this about? Well, basically, uh, one of the beauties of a wood frame building, especially heavy timber, is that it, it can burn and retain its strength. And when it burns, if the fire gets to the heavy timber, for instance, um, and it burns for a while, and it's been designed such that it's intended to protect itself, as, if you would, if it does catch on fire, protect itself for a while, um, that's what the calculated fire resistance method does. So essentially on the right here, you see you've got a, a core of your building element, and you size that to take the loads, as any designer would. What if it's going to burn? Well, let's size it to burn and take the loads. Okay. So there's a formula in, chapter six, uh, in the NDS, uh, chapter 16, that shows you how to do that. And we have another publication that gives examples of how to do that. So for instance, if you have an exposed beam or exposed column, uh, you can actually, depending on the loads on that, if you need a fire resistance in the building uh, and you want it to be exposed, you oversize it a little in, or, in order to uh, have that fire resistance. Now, if the fire is never addressed, well then, yeah, you have something that's going to continue to burn, no doubt. But most of our assumptions now are the fire is going to be addressed in one manner or another, either by the sprinkler systems immediately or by the fire service eventually. It's going to be addressed. One of the concerns, by the way, in the questions now for the ICC Tall uh, Wood Ad Hoc Committee is, What's the right level of fire resistance for a taller wood building? One of the things we have to take into account, of course, is how, how can the, the challenges for the fire service are different in a tall building than in a single story building. So how do we take that into account? But there's many applications for fire retardant treated wood in exterior walls of type three and four, but also in types one and two building, including the roof structure. Uh, structural considerations, there's a couple different things to think about as, as a designer, an engineer, an architect with wood design. Uh, our, new, our standards now are dual format, ASD, LRFD, so you know. There is such a thing as uh, in the building code, many of you have seen it, use it possibly, called conventional light frame construction. It's a special section 2308. It's not necessarily engineered to uh, current uh, loads, it's traditionally what's been permitted for one and two family dwellings mostly. It is in the commercial building code though for buildings within its scope, small buildings. 40 pounds per square foot live load on the floor is the main limitation and that'll limit a lot of buildings right away. Um, log structures and so forth. The wood frame construction manual is this, there's the cover for one and two family dwellings, but if you have a commercial building that fits within its scope, this is engineered to any geographic load. In other words, within this document, you have um, the whole range of national snow loads, whole, not much snow load here, seismic loads, got some seismic loads here, the whole range of wind loads. Uh, you can go to this document and it's prescriptive, meaning it's tabular. You don't necessarily have to be uh, registered designer to use it or to know how to use it. I won't tell you though that it's simple either to use. It's not really simple to use, it, but it's prescriptive and it is engineered. Um, and you might find it very useful, especially for dwellings, but I have it in today's presentation because there's a new section in the 2015 code that says if you have a small commercial building, for instance, slab on grade, that otherwise fit, uh, fits the dimensional uh, parameters for this document, you can go ahead and use this as a design tool on your commercial building. And it's the 2015 is all up to speed with all the new ASC 710 and 7, yeah, 710 uh, wind loads, which have changed, and seismic loads have changed somewhat too. I will say a word about precautions during construction, and the reason is, is that this is an area where wood construction is vulnerable during construction. 
We've had some very notable construction fires. AWC is concerned about this. Fire service is concerned about this. This normally doesn't involve life safety. These are buildings under construction. But nobody wants big uh, property losses either. And there are provisions in both the IBC and the IFC for things like fire watches when there's in off work hours and so forth. Many times it's at the discretion of the designer or the owner or the fire official or the code official. I want to draw attention to these and just tell you they're in here because this is an area where, um, remember all that discussion I had on fire resistance? Uh, in typical assemblies use gypsum for fire resistance. And if, it's, if a frame building catches on fire before the protection is up, uh, then you can, obviously, you have a much more hazardous situation than you have with other materials okay, at the construction phase. So it's something to think about. We take this very seriously, and ICC, International Code Council, is taking this seriously with a work group. Um, we've got a special website develop, or dedicated, I think it's constructionsafetypractices.com, that we work with the fire service to make sure we don't have unnecessary construction fires. But there are guidelines right in your code for this, so, so you can take a look. My, and finally, uh, these are the American Wood Council standards that are referenced in the code. They're in the back of this document uh, you have right here. There's a few more listed back there. DCA stands for Design for Code Acceptance, just more tools for you to use. Uh, I just want to make a, a, I want to comment. I'd like to talk a little bit about the fire retardant and treated wood. My, um, the mention was made about trusses. Um, and I, I'm not real knowledgeable. These gentlemen here are probably more knowledgeable on fire retardant treated wood trusses. Fire retardant treated wood applications for walls and sheathing are a little different. The testing has evolved, the ASTM testing, in response to those early problems. The testing now requires for fire retardant treated wood that they be tested under the heat and humidity conditions under which they will be used. My question is, do we have any cases of current formulation uses newer buildings where we've seen problems, or are these all old buildings that, you, that we're seeing the problems in? Questions about what I've said so far, or have I said anything that was uh, surprising or you just have a question about? That's a great question. I'll repeat it in case you didn't hear it. For buildings that allow wood construction, why do designers not choose wood more often? I paraphrase your question, right? Okay. And Pat, you'll have to help me, or I mean, you designers, you can help me on this one. Um, uh, or Dustin, you, you, you had a great answer to this at the other workshop. Um, number one, uh, we're still catching up with wood engineering education in our universities and design classes for wood. There's still quite a bit less than design classes for steel and concrete, but we're catching up. Number, and so therefore, when our designers learn steel or concrete, and they have confidence in that, and they get used to using that, and they don't want to change. They don't want to try something uh, new. Uh, number two, um, traditionally, there have been some things structurally that are cha more challenging for wood than for steel or concrete. That's, that's kind of self-evident. Those, those structural uh, limitations are going, beginning to go away. And so there'll be an evolution of more designers choosing uh, engineered wood products as opposed to steel or concrete. But there have been traditionally, uh, at least in my view, you've got certain uh, long spans and so forth that you had to accomplish with steel. You couldn't accomplish with, with wood. You know. um, what about the cost? Well, cost, wood is typically, in our experience and by our studies, wood is usually more economical. So to choose another material is usually going to be more expensive. That's a great, that's a great comment. So you've got uh, maintenance with wood that you don't necessarily have with other materials. I will say, however, that the building code covers that very well. And you can have wood buildings last for centuries if they're, if they're cared for. Yeah. But yeah, that's a concern. That's certainly a, um, one concern in some designers' minds depth restrictions. So in other words, you might have to have a larger member with wood than you would with steel. Is that what you're saying? 
Or with concrete, okay, yeah, okay. And what was the second one again? Resale value. Resale value. The perception possibly about the longevity of the building or the quality of the building, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, there's a question, is there a difference between glue laminated timber and cross laminated timber? And, and the answer is yes, they're, they're similar. Glue laminated timber, of course, is traditional now. Um, we've had the product standard for glue laminated timber. It's typically beams or columns of dimension lumber laminated together to form a beam or a column traditionally for glue laminated timber. There's gonna be a mention, or there was a mention at a uh, last week of uh, glue laminated panels are now uh, coming into play. So that's even more similar to CLT. Uh, but CLT is uh, diff different in that it's laminated together in crosswise manner so that you have, less, you have more dimensional stability between the crosswise laminations and it's large and long wall panels and roof panels and floor panels as opposed to a beam or a column. And yeah, I would love to hear, or what we need information on is if there's any, any of the current formulations are not working in your, in your thoughts, uh, especially here in South Carolina where it's still not permitted. You know, we've had good success with uh, formulations, the modern formulations in other places. We don't have any evidence of failures with the modern formulations, but what, I, what, what, I, what we need to know obviously is if you, in your work, if you come across that, please, you know, let's talk and talk more about that. 